Yeah. I'm David Kelly, president and CEO of Chicana Copper. Chicana is an ex explorer, uh, junior explorer based in Peru, uh, focusing on the Soledad mineral system. We originally started uh, drilling uh, high-grade tourmaline breccia pipes in a, in a small uh, land position that was expanded over time. And uh, we now know that the terminally breccia pipes are related to a much larger uh, mineral system uh, that includes uh, porphyry potential, high sulfidation, epithermal potential. And we're currently drilling on the southern half of our project, which hadn't been drilled before, uh, testing some of these other uh, target types with the goal of expanding our resource, uh, which originally included uh, seven breccia pipes to add additional high-grade tons, but potentially add uh, some new bulk tonnage discoveries to that inventory. I'm Tim Moody, uh, President and CEO of Pan Global Resources. Uh, again, we're an exploration company. Uh, all our projects are in Spain, uh, more particularly in the Iberian Pyrite Belt, where we have an advanced discovery and, and, and a new discoveries, uh, as well as a very st uh, strong healthy pipeline of other uh, opportunities where I believe we'll make additional discoveries. We're currently drill de uh, delineating uh, the western extension of our main target uh, with the aim of coming out with a resource within the next 12 months and we're also advancing our second discovery and we hope to uh, get the drill reefs turning on some new targets to to make uh, additional discoveries in the in the next uh, Next 12 months or so. Well, exciting times, gentlemen. Very exciting times. Certainly when it comes to pop, copper price, spent most of last year between 350 and, and, and 380 and here we are at sort of 416 has been as high as, as five bucks. Uh, it's much in demand, but companies like you need to kind of set yourselves up for success. And I, I'm kind of keen to understand how you go about doing that. And I wouldn't mind sort of tapping you up and also trying to understand the copper market maybe for people new to uh, natural resource investing or, e or even uh, copper for that for that matter so wh why don't we kind of start off with some some broad thematics and i'll and i'm sure you guys will uh you, you will you'll draw us back to your own companies but let's start let's start with the demand um picture i mean what what do we need to know david well i think you know the starting point for talking about demand is the fact that um you know there's always been in the last you know 15 years a prediction of a of a supply gap uh just based on normal market conditions right uh copper is a industrial metal that's used uh extensively uh, especially during times of economic expansion so when economies are doing well uh, people are building uh, in, in infrastructure projects or consuming that metal. And there was already a supply gap that was predicted just based on uh, normal uh, copper supply from existing mines and increasing demand. And then, you know, when you add to that the clean energy uh, revolution and all the demand that that puts on on top of it, 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 it exacerbates that, right? It, it, it expands it uh, to really to levels that we can't comprehend today. I mean, I've seen estimates where people say, you know, in the future to meet future demand, it will take eight times the amount of copper mining that exists today, which is just a phenomenal, uh, you know, uh, figure to get your head around, especially from geologists, you know, like Tim and myself, you know, and trying to figure out where is that copper supply going to to come from, and it ultimately goes back to to exploration, right? I mean, uh, M and A and merging companies and buying assets and stuff like that, existing known assets that doesn't that doesn't do anything for the future supply. It means that company X might have a, a nice new shiny copper mine that they acquired from somebody else, but in terms of new copper supply, that's where. The crunch is going to happen, and that's what you know. Uh, companies like, you know, Tim's and 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 Chicana Copper. That's what we're trying to do is find fundamentally new copper supply that can address that issue. Well, yeah, absolutely, and that's that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. Find the find the companies who are going to be able to actually do that, not talk about it, but actually do that. And like Tim, yeah, you know, in the past, you've um, we've had certainly had conversations around the best way to kind of set your your company up to be able to. Not just make discoveries, which you've done twice now, um, but make sure they're meaningful discoveries and don't sort of waste time marketing things which just aren't going to work. So, to remind, tell me a little bit about that. Yes, well, I mean, in, in Pan Global's situation, I think jurisdiction is important. When we're in Europe, 
Um, there are very few domestic new sources of, of copper. Um, so that puts us in a different picture, a different scenario to perhaps other parts of the other parts of the world. So for us, um, you know, having that uh, advantage of being in an area where the demand for copper is and uh, copper is recognised as one of the sort of main metals on the critical raw materials uh, list here, I think that gives us uh, an advantage. I guess the the other element, how to set ourselves up for success, is we're in. Uh, a, a volcanogenic massive sulfide district, which is known for having more of these super giant, these the biggest of this family of of ore deposit, which which includes copper uh, as one of the main commodities. So we're in the right place for for that uh, type of uh, deposit. There are other major companies around us. That's another big positive. So how do we set ourselves up for success? Obviously, you want to make have exploration success, which we've done, but then you want to develop, uh, have the scale where, as well as perhaps other some other aspects, which make it more compelling for those bigger producers to want to either buy you or buy your asset. Um, so, for us to do that, and all of the big, all of the big operating mines in the area that we're op- we're exploring are not just single ore bodies. They're clusters of ore bodies. You know, Nevis Corvo, a 300 million ton, ton you know, copper de- deposit, phenomenal grades you know, being operated today by Mundin. That's made up of seven different ore bodies that feed one complex. So for us, it's not just that we've made one discovery now or on a second. Is that if we can find three or four of these things, then we start to have the scale that competes with these with what the other bigger producers have got. So we're in the right environment to do that. We have freight infrastructure around us, but we've also got miners all around us as well. So that gives us another option, let's say a second prize, which is that we simply supply ore to one of those surrounding mines. And it's again, it's an advantage for us, for Pan Global, that we have more than one producer on our doorstep. So so for us, exploration, yeah, having having this portfolio that we've got, having a discovery already which has de-risked the company, but making additional having additional exploration success is the key to it for us. Is it slightly easier being in Spain, in Europe? Um, given I, it feel it feels like the world's kind of and we'll talk about this of geopolitics in a second, but it kind of feels like there's a compartmentalization of Europe, North America, Asia. Um, those are the kind of the, the big economies. We've got a big infrastructure um, plans across the board. You know, it's not just um, battery metal uh, cars. It's the it's the cables needed to supply the energy to charge those cars um, a, a, as well. Are there are there incentives there for companies like yourself being in in Europe? Because it, it it has in the past had this not in my backyard mentality. What's it like now? Yes, well, I think one one uh, element to the overall copper demands story that I guess doesn't get much attention is that uh, th- this whole uh, sort of autonomy, uh, yeah, the European Union looking to be more autonomous in supply of its own materials. And that's happening in Canada, it's happening in the US and other parts of the world. So, you know, that has, has somewhat changed the demand scenario so that uh, places like Europe are now looking for domestic sources of metals. Um, so I think that um, for us, you know, jurisdiction is important, but uh, we're also in it, you know, having... Having mines all around us is really is really important as well. I, I think that answers your question. Yeah, and 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 for you, David, obviously the whole North, North American ecosystem. You know, obviously the the, the top of conversations around e, EV, uh, electric vehicles, etc. For companies like yourself, is there an expectation that you'd be feeding into a North American market, or at the end of the day, is money money talks and copper goes anywhere it's asked for, or anywhere it's paid for? Yeah, I think I think that's the the latter is the case, Matt. Especially in South America, you know, there's some interesting things happening in Peru with this mega port that's being built by the Chinese in Shanghai. You know, this uh, Brazil to Peru railroad concept. 
um, you know, the, the world is changing and uh, it's, it's getting very, very interesting. The Chinese are obviously being, you know, a, as they always have been uh, forward thinking uh, strategist about uh, supply and that type of thing. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. I mean, uh, you know, copper concentrates are valuable enough that they can be shipped anywhere in the world pretty much uh, to to the, you know, uh, to the smelter that is willing to pay uh, the price, you know, the best contract you can get. So there is a global competitive market for copper concentrates. Um, and, and, you know, for me, you know, we're so early stage in terms of, you know, the life cycle of copper from, you know, discovery to production, our focus is on, you know, finding a quality asset, something that can be turned into a mine. Obviously we have tier one, uh, deposit aspirations, but at the end of the day, I'll, I'll be happy if we make a high grade discovery that, that, uh, turns into a mine and makes its investors a lot of money and, and, uh, gives us the ability to, benefit not just the shareholders but the stakeholders in the area and uh, including the communities and that type of thing so we always aim high we don't always uh succeed uh but there's lots of room for success in this industry especially now when you think about the lack of uh significant copper discoveries over the last two decades there's a there's a real demand for companies to be out there doing the work that we're doing even though you may not uh think that by looking at our share prices but uh but that too will come around right there will be a resurgence in interest in investing in natural resources non-renewable nat natural resources and i think all commodities uh over time are going to do very well but especially copper no in fact we had a, we, we had a um conversation yesterday on on nickel and you know the the there was a kind of bloomberg article we were discussing um the headline of which was uh, the deadly mining complex powering the EV revolution. So we're trying to, so industrial park in, in Indonesia. Now, they, they, I thought the interesting bit of that conversation was the repercussions of what that meant for uh, OEMs, uh, battery manufacturers, car manufacturers, saying, well, can we do business with companies like this who are being accused of maybe not doing things the right way? I, I think the answer we came to was no. Uh, which again suggests that there's, um, it, it, again, there's a kind of bifurcation of markets, which we're seeing a lot of at, at the moment. Are you subconscious, Tim, of the way that you've got to go about doing business and um, how you are perceived in the marketplace? Obviously, this is, you know, that would that was a case of, you know, downstream um, processing, et cetera, not expiration per se, but nevertheless, the social aspect here is seems extremely prevalent. Um, right from the get-go? Well, I think that nothing's changed so much in that respect recently. I mean, particularly in Europe, you, you know, the, the level at which you have to operate in terms of you know, de dealing with communities, the environmental aspects, all of those things, there's already a high bar. I don't think, think that, is, that has changed for us. What has changed is that this, uh, is this uh, more realisation that if if uh, there are future disruptions to logistics or su uh, supply of these critical materials, you know, can 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 there be a fallback or some uh, a more domestic source of these metals? Yeah, you know, so that there's a realization in Europe there has to be investment in infrastructure, there has to be uh, uh, investment and uh, promotion of exploration, for example, and development of of these uh, critical raw materials. So for us, um, we're seeing some direct action from the government in Spain, for example, at Andalusia in the south. Yeah, they've set up this new accelerator unit, uh, which I think I've spoken to you about before, where they're trying to provide a one-stop shop for the exploration companies, mining companies, so that when you apply for your mining licence, you go to this accelerator unit, and they can assure you or try and provide you a mining license within 27 months. If not, they compensate you. Now, that's that's an that's an excellent initiative. So they're really really uh, trying to you know, accelerate the whole permitting process. Uh, no shortcuts in terms of being you know, having to meet all the right 
environmental requirements and all, all of that sort of thing. But this, this, this is a great initiative. Uh, it, but it, it was rare as hen's teeth because I think the amount of times I have conversations with CEOs going, oh, the genium running uh, f- fi- financing uh, arena is broken. The, it, it doesn't work anymore. People, you know, resell are, are, are leaving in droves. They're off to ETFs or they just don't have the uh, available disposable um, income anymore. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really it's really tough. And, and then you've got things at the other end of the scale where you've kind of got BHP um, Anglo trying to do that deal. It was great because it kind of sh- you know, shone a spotlight on the fact that you know, copper is going to be scarce. But at the same time, it shows you there the intent of the big guys that mergers of equals is you know top of the list of things to do, not necessarily finance, junior exploration. It's like you guys fend for yourselves. If you find something of interest, we'll come trotting along, but we're not going to waste our money, time, effort um, being involved. So, how do how do we get around? How do we what else what else is needed? How do we get more money in this space, David? What do you reckon? Well, I I don't have the answer, Matt. I mean, I, I certainly see the problem, and I'm living the problem. Uh, it, you know, it, it's it, we're in this really weird space right now where it's difficult to raise. Uh, enough money to, you know, we, we work really hard to raise the money that, that we are drilling on right now. We were fully committed to, to drilling. That's, that's the, you know, you have to drill, right? We're not a lifestyle company. We're not in this to perpetuate our own careers or whatever. We're fully committed to deploying our capital to test our ideas and, 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 you know, uh, succeed or fail. And, and that's what exploration is all about. But um, it's it, we're in a really weird space right now. You know, you, there are multiple uh, royalty companies out now uh, taking their money and buying their own stock back, right? So that tells you they perceive greater value uh, in buying their own stock than, than buying royalties uh, out in, in the marketplace, which means that deal flow is not as high as, 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 you, as they may uh, indicate that it is. Um, you know, the, the, I think that part of the solution lies in the, the big majors, right? They're the ones, like you said, with the increase in, in uh, commodity prices, free money, right? They're making a lot more money. Their cost structure is changing, but it's not changing as fast as the commodity prices that change. So there's a window where these companies are making super profits and, and where can that money go? You know, you've seen uh, new programs like BHP's Explorer program where they're basically gifting money, you know, half a million dollars, a million dollars to explore, you know, simply to go out and do what we do, you know, no strings attached, no joint venture deals, no future rights or anything, which just let's create some goodwill in the industry. Let's help these companies out. But there needs to be a lot more of that, and I think the companies that are, the, you know, the 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 one segment of the industry that's best positioned to help right now are the major mining companies through, you know, deals, programs like this, that type of thing. Retail investors, you know, have been created enormous lift in our funding capability in times past, especially uh, after you know, the global financial crisis, but we don't see that right now. Yeah. I mean, Tim, is there, is there a solution? Yeah. Well, um, I don't have a silver bullet for this one either, but um, look, I, I think just to follow on from what David said, look, there, there is interest from the, from the majors in what we're doing. I'm sure David's had, had approaches. Um, you know, we've had, we've got confidentiality agreements in place. We've had, uh, we've, we've continued to get our, our door knocked on from, from bigger companies. So, so there is that interest out there. Um, there are some other initiatives like the BHP one. Rio Tinto has this new technology, Newton or whatever, which is you know uh, is attracting some some partnerships, uh, etc. So, um, but I, I think perhaps one of the solutions, and we're starting to see that, is is this the type of partnerships you might develop and how you might where you source the funding. You know, for example, you know perhaps a drilling company or even a, a smelter. Or uh, there are other pockets of money out there. Yep, we have to be perhaps a bit more innovative. Um, yeah, the the investor base has probably changed a little bit as well. I mean, what the way people invest. You know, uh, you, you get the uh, my my son just the other day was telling me about this this app which you know, follows follows an investor. They basically invest. Like, they track somebody and they they will invest 
on the basis of how whoever that uh, person they're following uh, is is investing. So there's there's a whole lot of uh, new ways to invest. I think so. I think we need to look at the audience that we're or where the investor money is going to come from. Um, the other thing I think we're seeing, you know, uh, is in Europe there's establishing they're establishing a couple of billion dollar funds which are aimed at uh, providing ca- or the the critical raw materials uh, initiatives. Um, yeah, so they're more downstream. Um, it's money you might more for downstream things, but we're trying, we're certainly having some conversation to see if we can start to um, attract some some funding from at bottom end of the chain, the exploration end of the the, the, the chain. Well, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. I, I was... Um... At a, a drinks day, local sort of thing, r- r- ranch here, and it, a couple of interesting guys um, there. His friends, the family. Well, you, one worked at works at uh, Rothschild, right? And he's saying we've got more money than we've ever had. Um, we need to get after this kind of climate change uh, agenda. We need to look at this net zero. We are we we just can't find enough deals, right? We've got more money than we have deals, and he said. There's money out there. It's just a question of how companies position themselves um, and what that narrative looks like in a way that we can understand it because we're coming as generalists into a space we don't have a lot of track record or history on, right? So I think people are wrapping themselves around the the um, uh, nuclear conversation. So that's great for uranium companies. I think copper was the next word out of uh, out of his mouth. Um, because they understand the the demand side of the story, as David said at the beginning, it, it it it's coming and the waves of it are coming. But I guess the issue here, and this goes back to you know, your son's example of oh, we you know people following, um, you know people who do investing, and, that, and that's great if you know what you're talking about. Because unfortunately, what we've seen is um, exploration companies, junior miners, um, let's say the vast majority, you know, ninety five out of a hundred will not make it over the line. So, so you've got to find the companies that will or setting themselves up for success in, in, in the future. And it's the same for this, you know, Chuck Hugo at Rothschild. It's the same for him. He's got to be sure that he's going to put his money into something that's going to work. And I think that's, I think what I'm trying to understand today from, from you guys, some of the challenges that you've, you've both been around the block, both been successful making discoveries and so forth. But how do you, how does how do we take these companies now forward in a way that moves them to the next phase, either for you to kind of go again or for you know someone else to kind of pick up with a bigger balance sheet, whatever your particular business model is. So the money's there, and they understand the the um, thesis, the supply demand fundamentals for it, but they're seeing a lot of companies maybe not doing so well, partly maybe um, ge- geographic. You know, there's some countries which perhaps making it a little bit more difficult. There's some um, politicking going on as well, um, which again makes it difficult. And bottom line is it takes, where it may have taken 10 years in the past, it's maybe taking 15, 20 years to get into production these days. So there's a lot of barriers. So how, how, like if you're going into a conversation, Tim, with someone like that, what are you, what are you saying to them? Yeah, well, I, look, I, I think uh, jurisdiction's really, uh, you yeah. know, you hear that a lot. Jurisdiction is really, really important, but it it, it is. Um, so the more you can de-risk an investment position for investors, I think the better it is. So I think what we're, you know, we're in a an environment. I'm sorry, a, a, a location which is pro mining. Uh, it's not just this in, um, accelerator unit that I mentioned. Permitting for mines in in the Iberian Pirate Belt in Spain. Has been quick. Was quick before. I mean, there I can listen, name examples where mines have been permitted from the first drill hole to uh, uh, mining permit being granted in under four years. Um, yeah, the Magdalena discovery, for example, first drill hole in 2012 was permitted by 2015. It was in production, I think, by then. So very, very things can get done very quickly here. So, so that's I think that's uh, I think that's one of the things I try to convey is that we it's not just that we're exploring company we actually have something already we're in a place that is pro mining and not only that it's something that could be brought into production pretty quickly low risk yeah we're not looking at uh, a deep 
mega deposit like Philo's discovery, which is phenomenal, but maybe 20 years you know, in the making before we see any copper coming from that. You know, we're, in a play, we're in a different scenario. We can put something into production potentially pretty quickly in a, in a location surrounded by mines in an area that wants you. Um, yeah, so I think that's the way I try and portray us. And then in the European audience, yeah, it was interesting uh, three or four weeks ago when I did a, a road show in, in Germany, in Zurich and so on, uh, talking to generalist, mostly generalist investors, you know, and asking the question, you know, can they name any new uh, copper uh, mines or do, uh, things that will be my, new copper mines in the next uh, next few years in in Europe? And there's a big head scratch. Yeah, I can I can think of uh, perhaps one or two, and that's about it. So just that realization uh, starts to alert people. Okay, yes, yeah. If you've got one of these things, which is it could be important in the future, is critical material. That's that ticks a big box. And then copper, obviously, with its green credentials, let's say, important, critical for the energy transition. Yeah, I think that helps as well in, in the European context. David, if, 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 I'm going to draw you into this conversation as well. You know, you talked earlier about the the sort of demand uh, e- equation. We've got supply issues. So, you know, I've mentioned you've got Cadelco down six percent or so, or, or more. Um, you know, copper grades are getting lower and lower. It's getting they're getting deeper and deeper. It's getting more expensive. Um, we saw a reaction in the market recently possibly, say, driven by the BHP Anglo uh, transaction. Um, when, you're, when you're speaking to investors, because you did that round recently, you got Rick Rule came into your investment. He thinks you've got something quite big there. He thinks you've got good grades and, you know, you've got, and you've got some money now to kind of get after it in, in a way. But did they need any persuading or was it quite obvious? Well, you know, Rick is a, a very astute investor, as you know, you know, and I, I love his investment philosophy. You know, he, he, he writes checks when people are cashing checks. Uh, you know, he, he, he sells when people are buying and he buys when people are selling. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the short side to his, uh, you know, summary of, of his investment philosophy. And he takes risks and he understands the exploration industry very, very well. And he knows that one or two wins will amortize uh, all the other losses and still make him a lot of money. Right. So he really likes companies that are taking bold uh, swings, uh, being really aggressive and bold on their exploration, knowing full well that most exploration companies fail. Uh, but therein lies the opportunity. And that's, you know, if you trace it all the way back, why is copper at 450? Well, you know, when I started my career, uh, it was 58 cents. And, you know, this year it hit $5, you know. So there is uh, a realization uh, that, you know, commodities will become more valuable uh, in the future. It's, it's, it's inevitable. They're non-renewable resources, right? We can't go out and make uh, copper. We can't grow copper. We can recycle it. And, you know, that's expensive. And there is always going to be a need to uh, to recycle as much as we can for all commodities, but it's not going to fill, uh, fill the demand uh, gap. So, uh, you know, I think the more people understand like Rick's investment philosophy, I think the better off they will be. And, you know, he does have a very, very strong following. When Rick came into our financing, he brought a lot of other investors that are learning from him. He's a great educator, as you know, as well. You know, he does his workshops and his boot camps and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot more of that needed uh, out there. There are lots of companies to invest in. Uh, but in my opinion, you want the ones that are, that are drilling, that are doing the hard technical work, uh, and they're, and they're, they're out there, um, you know, putting their capital to work to try to make that next new discovery. And that's, you know, there, you'd be surprised. Well, maybe you wouldn't be Matt, but you know, there are a lot of companies out there that don't do that. Right. And aren't deploying that capital in that way. Right. No, no, let's talk, let's talk about um, one of the other kind of big, big topics of the moment, which is, and we've seen a lot in South America recently. So I think Tim's been quite clear in saying jurisdiction, jurisdiction for him is, is, is the number one thing. South America has been um, quite political of late. 
um, you know, we, we've we've seen it. I was in your backyard, Peru. We've seen it down in Chile. We've seen Ecuador. We, we've seen it a, a, everywhere, right? It comes at around the time of elections usually, because um, it's a very nice time to kind of raise raise its head. Um, what's the what's the reality in the ground in terms of if a, if a, if a company is doing things in the right way with the right permissions with the right social license? It is South America a place to do business? Well, you know, South America is all over the map. As you know, you've got, you know, you've got Venezuela at one end of the of the spectrum, and then you have, you know, established uh, mining countries where mining is a part of the, the culture. It's a, it's a major uh, foundation for their economy. C- countries like uh, Chile and Peru, uh, Brazil, um, you know, Peru is the second largest copper producer in the world. And I've gone back and looked at all the different political uh, administrations, all the different parties, all the different administrations going back, you know, 25, 30 years and how that affects the best measure of the mining activity in the country, which I think is production. And if you look at copper production versus uh, left wing uh, governments, right wing governments, uh, corrupt governments, it doesn't have an impact. It certainly has an impact on the headlines and uh, people's perception of what's going on in the country. But in terms of actually impacting, you know, the uh, the mining industry in Peru, I think you get to a critical level. If you're if you're a country that's wanting to develop a mining industry, say like Ecuador, great geology, uh, you know, phenomenal endowment, but not you know, has it made it yet in terms of the global scale, scale in terms of uh, production, but wants to get there. Uh, that's a different story. But if you're if you're there, if you're a top global producer in, in any of the major commodities, uh, you know, it, it's, it takes a lot to push something like that off. Now, you can look at Panama. Great example. World-class copper mine, you know, now sitting dormant because of, of some very unfortunate uh political uh and and social outcry about you know uh unfairness and and that type of thing uh you know so you kind of have to look at the commodity base and how many operations how many world-class mines are there in country and you know i believe that the countries that are well established will continue to do well from a mining standpoint but notwithstanding you know issues that tim brought up you know permit delays and stuff like that a lot of the Latin American countries have very bureaucratic processes in terms of how you get things done. And, you know, the, 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 the companies that I work with, uh, the consortium of uh, big major producers all the way down to juniors, we banded together and we send a very, very strong message to uh, the, the Peruvian government on a regular basis about how things have to improve. And we are seeing improvements. Uh, they're never as fast as we would like, but I'm very confident in Peru uh, to remain a, a mining country. It's a, it's a, it has great endowment. It has a, uh, a very good mining law and a very good environmental law uh, that we're, we're glad to, to operate under because I think it, it gives credibility to, to the mining industry. So, you know, we're, we're happy to be there. We think that Peru's going to be a, a major contributor on the global scale for a long, long time. Right. And, and I'll just I'll kind of finish off on price because we've kind of danced around price. Obviously, price went over five bucks recently. Everyone got super, super excited. Um, everyone looking for copper projects. Some companies segueing to uh, be copper companies and some companies starting to report their metals in copper rather than gold or whatever they were doing before. So people like, people see the potential in the industry. And I think what we're seeing with, you know, say a Cobra um, and Panama, et cetera, et cetera, and, and Cadelco and even, um, you know, Ivanhoe Mines, et cetera, production is struggling. That's going to have a dramatic effect on pricing in the market once the space. What does that do for a company like yours, um, Tim, you know, we, we, we talk all we like about whether um, retail is sort of you know, into junior mining or not, but when market prices move, it tends to have a uh, you know quite an effect on, on junior explorers. What's your expectation? Yeah, well, look, I, I, I'm bullish for the long term. I'm bullish in the short term, um, really. I, I'm short term. I'm talking say the next twelve months. I think uh, yeah, we yes, we've we've been testing 
new highs over the last couple of years, but um, you know it's still still taking some time to get the share price. Yeah, uh, sorry, the uh, copper price really sort of m- moving to uh, to meet that sort of demand, the supply demand gap, gap that David talked about before. I mean, even under the most conservative situations, you know, the world is still growing, population is still growing, copper demand is still increasing. Even if you take away, um, let's say, electrification and, and so on, you know, other geopolitical sort of wars and you know, all of these sorts of things, you know, the, de- the amount of copper that's being consumed is still, is still growing. So um, at the same time, we're seeing, and this has been a, a trend for the last 20, 30 years, that mines are getting deeper, they're getting uh, lower grade, they're getting, let's say, the, the technical risk is increasing with that as well, and sometimes the juris- jurisdictional issues are not getting easier either. So um, all that does is paint a picture of, in- of yeah, an, an increasing pressure on, on, this, on, on demand for copper going forward. And at the moment, there's an underinvestment, in my view, both on ex- mine expansions, but also particularly on ex- exploration. So that's that's the sort of background, I think, to a growing copper price under any any uh, situation. But then, if you believe also what many are saying about you know copper uh, consumption doubling, you know, you have the next twenty five years. Yeah, double double the copper consumption is what we've consumed in all of, all of history up until now. Yeah, that translates to about a million tons of extra copper being added every year. That's equivalent to one Escondida, which is the world's biggest copper producing mine today. Every year being added to to uh, the the world's uh, yeah copper mining um, thing. That's not happening. That's that's sort of. Escondida is equivalent to about sort of five world-class copper mines if you consider 200,000 tonnes per annum copper production world-class. We're not just, the world is just not doing that. So yeah, where's it going to come? How's the world going to react? The easiest way is for the copper price to go up so that the perhaps what is marginal ore today becomes more feasible to mine. Um, so in our situ- in pan-global situation, we'll, we'll be a beneficiary of that. Having something that could be brought into production in the relatively near term is a big advantage. We can ride on the co- co- coattails of, a, of a, a rising and hopefully accelerating copper price over the next sort of five to ten years. Yeah, I, I, was, on, I was on stage. I was um, um, running a panel on stage in Quebec a couple of weeks ago with I it was a legends session, ale- allegedly legends session. And um, one of the guys who stood up and said, look, if copper hit 10 bucks tomorrow, we're still 10 years too late to get anywhere near uh, the kind of demand that's coming demand that's coming down the line. And uh, the audience kind of, you, you could hear it. And they're going, well, what? You know, so... If it kind of feels like we're kind of, everyone's a bit late to the party, but pr- price incentive will certainly um, be very helpful. It will help maybe cover up a multitude of sins on some of the the the, um, the developers who perhaps are would str- struggle with margin at the moment. But it will also be a great incentive for maybe for uh, explorers to go out there and find good projects like both of you have. So look, gentlemen, I, I, I thank you very much today for your sort of macro, just sharing with us your kind of macro thoughts and insights and so forth, and obviously sprinkling the conversation with uh, about your own companies. But um, maybe you'll just take us out with, maybe I'll give you two minutes each to just um, maybe pitch your own companies to anyone listening, watching, or reading about um, this session of ours. So maybe, um, David, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I mean, this has been a real interesting conversation, Matt. And you know, the the price it is exciting to see copper, you know, uh, soar. And, and when it hit five dollars, I think the day it hit five dollars, silver was over thirty, and gold was over twenty four hundred. And you know, we're a copper, silver, uh, gold uh, deposit, right? We have very significant grades in, in all 
Uh, all cases we had, as you know, the 12 meter massive sulfide intercept that was 27% copper. We've hit 42 grams gold in our, our uh, drilling, and we've hit five kilograms of silver in our drilling. So we're excited by uh, grade. And, you know, uh, the, the nice thing about grade is you don't have to have peaking metal prices to make your project look good, right? You can you can have a great looking project that at, at, at moderate uh, commodity prices and, and higher commodity prices just help it look all that much better. So you were asking earlier about, you know, how do you position a company for success and being taken out or, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the things, you know, the bottom line really is, is the economics. How, how does that project stack up? And you can have small production high grade uh, deposits, or you can have big giant super low grade deposits. And you know, there's a big difference in 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 all aspects of that in terms of the capital that's required to build that mine, in terms of the environmental impact, uh, in terms of uh, you know carbon emissions per pound of copper. If you look at it that way, and you know, we we love high grade, right? We would love to have a high grade uh, tourmaline breccia pipe resource that could be developed at the same time as, as, a uh, high sulfidation lithocap system. That's, that's, uh, that has a very, very, uh, substantial silver resource. And then of course, you know, the porphyry side of the story, everyone would love to find a, a porphyry. Uh, and we, we think that we have the potential to, you know, we certainly have all three of those styles, uh, on our property. So we're, we're swinging for the fence. Uh, we're, we are being very, very bold in our exploration. We're testing our ideas and they will succeed or fail. But our track record has been very good uh, so far. We've had delays with COVID, of course. We've had delays, uh, you know, with uh, with permit delays and, and off-rail administrations that came in for a brief period of time in Peru, which has happened many, many times in the past. So we keep our head down. We work hard. We try to do uh, the best science we can uh, to technically execute our programs. And, you know, we hope that it coincides with the super cycle uh, again. And that's, we, we all believe is, is going to happen. Uh, but in the meantime, you can't control that. What we do is we try to focus on what we can control. Yeah, so uh, for Pan Global, I think you know, for for investors, I think we today we op, op, offer excellent value. Like David's company, we're a company that drills. We've had success, and I think we're going to have a lot more. You know, so for an investor looking at, at Bang Global, we've got a we have a copper discovery. It's the right commodity, I believe. We have some tin, some silver, with that, and we have a new discovery which is copper, gold, and silver. Um, so a nice addition. But as I said, if we want to compete with some of the other bigger producers here, you have the objective of finding something that could be a standalone um, dis, um, operation, then we need to make multiple discoveries just like some of the other big mines in the surrounding area. So we have the target portfolio to do that. We have the targets ready to drill at the moment. Uh, it's just a case of turning the drill reason. Uh, loose on those and that that really comes back to getting the share price moving yeah you know, making sure we've got the funding to be able to do that i can put five or six drill rigs to work tomorrow if i had if uh if the if the funding and so on was there so um, it's no no shortage of places to put the drill rigs. i'm confident we'll make additional discoveries if we do that that puts a target on our back both from nearby producers but other uh, other companies looking for new copper assets in secure parts of the world in areas that want mining in areas that have a demonstrated track record for converting exploration success into new mines so i think that's what pan global offers as i say the strength of our portfolio our target portfolio is excellent we are looking at some new opportunities i hope to be able to put some news out soon on on some of the new things we're looking at as well which uh, which i think are also pre pretty exciting uh, for us as well. Right, right. Well, like Tim and um, David, thanks very much for spending time with us today. People, like I say, lis listening in, the these are two companies I quite like. They run the they run properly um, with, with teams who, you know, are very, very honest about the way that they allocate their capital. And I appreciate that. So, gentlemen, we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you, Matt. It was a pleasure.